I'd like to welcome back uh, Kim Lau at this time. Uh, and Kim will be talking to us about the International Forest Carbon Inventory Activity. Thank you, Kim. I'll, Thank I'll, you. Give, I'll give you three little bars of three minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, all right, me again. Um, uh, half my time is spent on DPI. Half my time is spent on CRC. Spare time I do um, uh, SAR type stuff. The other half of my time I manage this project, which is a large um, project, contractual research project uh, from the Department of Climate Change. Now, IFC, which is the International Forest Carbon Initiative, um, just as a background on this, the duration of this is um, that the project is a, a two-year project. Um, it's due to finish in June of next year of 2011, uh, just because of the nature of it. We're hopeful that it will, will continue, but um, obviously we have to deliver, <coughs> excuse me, um, before that's going to be happening. <coughs> the project itself is an outgrowth. Some of you will remember that in 2007, John Howard made the announcement that Australia would, uh, he created or or Australia would commit $200 million to a global initiative on forests and climate. And an awful lot of that money was intended to um, facilitate carbon accounting um, in third world countries. So of course with $200 million, we really have a flush budget. You know, it's really kind of pleasant um, to have that much money. Um, we are funded by the Department of Climate Change, obviously with a, um, a fraction of that amount of money. And what we do in IFSI is that we have a research alliance. We've created a research alliance with CSIRO, um, and those are people both in Canberra and out at Floriat, uh, WA, next to Landgate, same building, um, and also with Forestry Tasmania. With that background, the project is not only a science, having science objectives, and I will get to the science objectives, but carbon accounting, as you can imagine, and international carbon accounting is quite a political land, land uh, mine and um, minefield. And so part of what we're trying to do in this is do good science, but we're also trying to find our way politically. Um, so part of it is we're trying to position, the funding comes from the Department of Climate Change. They have the National Carbon Accounting System that was established a while ago that I'm sure some of you are aware of. Um, the National Carbon Accounting System really does make Australia a leader in carbon accounting. And so Australia, for all sorts of different reasons, would like to see that carbon accounting system that has been developed to have our technology and, and the way we go about doing our carbon accounts of, of saying where the carbon is exported internationally but also accepted internationally. So part of what this project about is creating the science necessary to position us internationally so that the carbon accounting system is accepted, which means it creates potentially a market for our spatial people internationally, but it also then makes things a little bit easier to show compliance with Kyoto, uh, Kyoto Accords and things like that. Um, so we want to position ourselves internationally. We want to, we want to gain acceptance um, of, of Australia's carbon accounting approach. And, in, and by doing that, we're trying to facilitate carbon accounting in selected countries, mainly the ones that are close to us, like Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and those countries that will, will be required to do their carbon accounts, but because they don't have the technological infrastructure that we have, it becomes a bit more difficult for them. In the international context, this is something, as, as project leader on this, I still don't have a complete handle on all the players in this. One of the group, groups that we interact with is the Group on Earth Observations. Our project, our part of this carbon initiative is really focused on remote sensing, as you can imagine. There are other aspects of it. One of the, the groups that we interact with is the Group on Earth Observations, which is a very loosely held together coalition of, of governments. So governments being involved, it tends to carry different types of weight than CEOS. CEOS is the Committee on Earth Observation. That's composed largely of space agencies. So that will be groups like NASA, um, the, um, the group that puts SPOT up out of um, France, data providers that are committed to providing imagery to do the carbon accounting, 
but they also are looking after the interests of the agencies that they represent. Governments, on the other hand, they have different imperatives. And then also in this space, you have a, v a variety of scientific groups uh, exemplified, but certainly not this being monopoli, monopoly, by groups called Goffsey Gold, which is the group on uh, forest, I always have to look at a group, and uh, forest and carbon dynamics and land cover dynamics, primarily scientists. And again, the scientists are the ones that drive the science, Space agencies are holding the imagery. It's governments that have the ultimate responsibility for signing treaties. And these groups kind of work in the same space. And the levels of collaboration are dependent on the particular activity that's going on. But all are relevant to what we're trying to do and the political aims of trying to make sure that we position Australia well in the international carbon accounting arena. So what we're doing, are our relevance with what we're trying to do in the IFC program is GEO, the Group on Earth Observations, which again is this loosely held together coalition of governments. Um, there's a number of tasks they're doing. I, the main game is not necessarily what we're doing, but what we're doing is an important part of it. And within the way they describe their different tasks, you have the GEO Forest Carbon Tracking Task, which is really where we fit into this. And one of the initiatives that they've made, that has been made in GEO, is to have 10 international demonstrators. The demonstrators are Brazil, Mexico, Guyana, Cameroon, Tanzania, Colombia, Peru, Cameroon, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo, Indonesia, and Australia. The two that are the most active are Australia and Mexico. Mexico is reasonably advanced in carbon tracking um, because even as long ago as about 10 years, I did. Um, uh, I attended a workshop in Mexico where they were trying to come to grips with national forest inventory um, because they are making a commitment to um, really understanding their, their uh, forest resources. Australia is also quite advanced, and the reason Australia is advanced is because within GEO, even though we have this idea of these demonstrators, Australia is the only one who's actually committed any dollars to making it happen. Um, and part of that goes to wanting to position ourselves um, well. Now the demonstrators, then we get to the science objectives of these. And the science objectives is trying to explore sensor interoperability for carbon accounting. Interoperability in this sense means the National Carbon Accounting System of Australia is based on thematic mapper data. Thematic mapper, that satellite was meant to fail five to seven years ago and it's still producing good data, um, but the next the next Landsat to provide continuity isn't going to be launched until 2012, which has made the international community say, okay, well, we've got to look at this and start not basing our carbon accounting on a single sensor that may not be up there in two, five, ten years from now. So a lot of what's being focused on is radar and um, looking at different opportunities for radar to provide interoperable coverage. Radar also has the advantage, of course, that in tropical countries it has good cloud penetration, and tropical countries always have that problem. So one of the science objectives is just trying to say, can you create a carbon accounting system using SPOT one year, TM the next year, radar the next year, um, and some other source? We also need to establish a verification methodology. This causes a lot of confusion in the, the GOFCT task because when it comes to verification, remote sensors tend to look at it as getting classifications correct. When it comes to verification for carbon accounting, it's a matter of holding something up to the international community that when you say, we have this much carbon, they'll say, we agree with that. It's a different process than the image verification or classification validation. So that's something that we need to look at. We're trying to contribute to protocol documents that will form the foundation of how international carbon accounting is done. And again, these provide an opportunity to position Australia in this space. Um, and then also we're developing and delivering training. Some of you, there, DCC will be running a training course for the carbon accounting in February. We're providing logistical support to that. And just yesterday, I signed the contract on that. So, to actually get to what it is we're actually doing to give you a bit of um, research results is the challenge is really to say, okay, we've got Landsat up here. That comes from the Department of Climate Change. 
that is a Pulsar mosaic that we have made um, of Tasmania, of course. Um, and the, the key is to then be able to process that and process that into something that will be forest, non-forest for the moment so that you can use TM for 2007 and so that you can use radar interchangeably for 2009. Um, Horizon 1A, when we're looking at the carbon accounting products, currently in remote sensing, it's all about forest or non-forest. But the ultimate goal of carbon accounting is to get to forest density, um, both natural and anthropogenic. And so we have to get to a, a point where we can get much more sophisticated. For now, we're lucky, forest, non-forest, um, is not as demanding, but it's certainly not easy. So when, we, okay, so when we look at it and we say interoperability, the issues, that represents a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer square in forestry t uh, in Tasmania that I've cut out of the DCC imagery. That's a TM image, measures 10 kilometers on a side. When that was processed by DCC into forest and non-forest, that's what came up. The um, the green is the forest, the other is the non-forest area. If we then say we take our Pulsar scene, we process that, and our processing is currently preliminary, in this case there's only 25 hectares difference between those two, which, which is really, really good. And when you then try to take it to a more localized level, you can start picking, picking up some of the minor differences that are out there, 25 meter pixels, but overall on a 10,000 hectare seen or piece of the terrain to only be off by 25 hectares, that's pretty good. Well, you'll see I've labeled that the good. Let me show you the bad and the ugly, um, which in parentheses should also be more typical, frankly. Those are images, those are still 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares. That's the processing that was done on them um, by the TM. And again, green is forest and the um, uh, the sort of tan color is the non-forest. The Pulsar is that. Preliminary classification, but the goal of the interoperability, if you'll recall, is to be able to take this, that scene, and plug it from 2009, and plug it into a system where that is your 2007 version, and say, okay, how much deforestation did we pick up? That's pretty easy, it's almost 100%. It's obviously an, an artifact. So when we talk about trying to get the interoperability, these are the types of challenges um, that we're dealing with and what we're trying to do in this project. The other thing that I would be remiss in um, if I didn't mention it because it's near and dear to my heart is the validation methods to try and meet, to demonstrate that we have met international standards for carbon accounting so that if we say there's a million tons of carbon out there, the international community says, yes, we agree with that. Um, verification of this stuff is, is quite challenging, um, both from an Im image analysis perspective, so you don't get those kinds of artifacts, but also statistically, because you're trying to verify land cover change, which is relatively rare, even in Queensland, it's no more than, than um, less than a percent per year. So what those little squares I showed you are is I've gone out and I've cut out 56 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares. Incidentally, those that know Tasmania and want to know where those little ones I pulled out, the good one, whoops, the good one is located there. The bad and the ugly are located there and there. So if we look at it and if you were saying, oh, well, with that being Tasmania, one must come down from the southwest where the terrain is very different. No, in fact, that one's very good, that one's very bad, that one's really, really bad. And they come from about the same area because of difference in sensor characteristics. So the challenge in terms of the international compliance is to say, um, what if we're going to use this sort of approach to an area-based approach, which kind of have to do with change, how many of those little squares are we eventually going to need? What percentage of the terrain? And it looks to be about 20, which is where these blue lines stabilize. They don't go bouncing all over the place. But again, that's what we have to explore. Now, the final thing that I'll leave you with is why is the CRC doing this? Well, for us, um, it's contractual work. It brings cash in um, and pays that other half of my salary and all that spare time that I have. Uh, it also allows us as a CRC to be part of international carbon accounting and position ourselves as a player in this space. 
It allows us to have direct influence on the image processing protocols that are eventually going to be adopted based on the guidance documents. Um, we're a player in domestic, domestic carbon accounting, which is good for us as a CRC. Um, we also have expertise in the CRC on radar processing. This helps fund that and consolidate it. And also the international verification procedures are quite challenging to meet international standards. We get to be seen as being quite prominent in that area, which is then likely to um, position us well when it comes to working with the Indonesias, the Papua New Guineas, and all the other demonstrator um, countries. Thank you.